Um, so this talk is about, we will uh, go back to the topological phases and this is a theory talk and I will explain what we mean by the, I uh, will start with that also. So topological phases are usually um, um, uh, protected by a particular symmetry and then the idea would be once you break that symmetry, do you really lose that topological phase, do you gap out the estates immediately? And what I will show through examples, we will not draw a general conclusions, um, but what we will show through examples that uh, you don't. They are robust up to certain critical value of the perturbations that you put and we will try to put that uh, uh, symmetry breaking perturbations in various ways. And then we'll show that you don't break those things and you still have the helical estates and all, certain point. And of course, then the question will be what sort of topological invariance that you get in such cases. And this work is done by uh, two undergrads, uh, Arpid and um, also there was another undergrad, uh, Nepal. And then we started looking into what sort of anomaly one can get in such symmetry broken topological phases and for that I had to learn a lot of um, chiral anomaly and all these things and I was benefited with discussions with uh, Ittimanda from um, ISC and we still, um, okay, so this will be the paper which will be put on archive soon enough. <coughs> so this is the, so, so we, we start asking this question, how robust are the topological phases with broken symmetry? And, uh, and um, yeah, so here and, and the example that we will take is the quantum spin hall effect in a 2 plus 1 dimension topological, um, Z2 topological phase protected by time reversal symmetry. And then we will break that time reversal symmetry with various magnetic order and also non magnetic order. But we will be looking into one particular case where the broken, uh, the time reversal symmetry will be broken and we will study how these helical states and all these things uh, responds to that. And what we will find, uh, some new quantization phenomena of the current or charge and all, which may be not related to the um, Hall effect, but can be something else. And finally, we will talk about some anomalies that will come out in these uh, settings, like helical anomaly, which will be, which I'll explain. It's similar to chiral anomaly, but it will be for the two spin states and magnetoelectric effects and so on and so forth. <coughs> yeah, so this is a very general slide. I'll start. So the way we classify phases can be thought of two, maybe even more. But one of, one of them is by broken symmetry phases. You look into who, to which symmetry is broken and you uh, see what sort of it, um, quantum phase that it appears. PT symmetry will give you a multiferroelectric, uh, ferroelectric, and so forth. On the other hand, once you talk about topological phases, we do the in, the in the reverse way. We look into what sort of a symmetry that is protected and we have a well-defined table called 10 for, uh, for uh, called classifications in which we look into the time reversal, charge conjugations and chiral symmetry. And accordingly for different dimensions, we have a well-defined uh, predictions what sort of a topological phase you will get. And our job is now to combine these two and see how whether this table is robust to that or it changes and so on. So how robust is this topological table? And we find that even if you lose one of the symmetry, the topological phase actually don't change sometimes. Continuously, here in this case, but there are cases, uh, maybe one, I, I'll address that. Uh, there are also examples in the literature, other people have done. For example, explicit symmetry breaking will be able by putting a magnetic field. And there also people have shown that some of these helical esters will be robust up to critical value of the magnetic field. Here I will talk about only continuous symmetry. And then, as I said, what sort of a topological indicator you get in such a case. And um, uh, we'll talk about some quantum anomalies. And I will talk about this particular case in two dimensions in which we have a Z2. And then once you break that, we see helical. So 
the model, so as I said, I will start with only example. I will not draw any general conclusions, although it's possible that such things should be studied or can be studied in all the other geometry classes as well. But the model, we think it's some, somewhat general. So the conclusions we'll draw should also be valid for all other uh, quantum spin hole states. So the somewhat general model that we, uh, I will use is something that we introduced a few years back is when I was trying to, like when a lot of people were, everybody was predicting new materials by DFT calculations to get topological insulators, we thought of, is there a way to engineer such a thing with layered, with atoms, uh, placing uh, one, one layer at a time and so on. So, forth. so what are the key ingredients one requires if you really want to engineer such a thing at home? And that, uh, that was one of the things that we did here, and we will be using that model. So the model is very simple. You take a 2D electron gas, which has a Rasper spin orbit coupling. This is the 2 by 2 Hamiltonian for that, with alpha being the Rasper spin orbit coupling. And you, and this will be the band structure, which has a, uh, because the time reversal symmetry is there, so you have a Kramer's degeneracy, but there is a band splitting because of the loss of the parity. So then what one, and one does gap out because you need to have an insulator. So one doesn't gap out that unless you break the time of symmetry. But there is another way to gap it out. And that's, that's, the, the, uh, that's the key. So what we say, bring a, a, a prepare a Rasper bilayer with the second layer, which, which spin orbit coupling should be completely opposite to the previous one. And you allow them uh, some quantum tunneling, spin non flip. Uh, quantum tunneling. So what you are doing is that you are actually bringing the helical inversion, you are putting the band inversion or helical inversion by hand so that you do not actually have to look for a band inverted say uh, thing to uh, by tuning parameter. You are actually putting the band inversions by hand. So once you put that, so A would be one layer and B is the another layer with the opposite spin orbit coupling. So effectively, this layer will act as a parity conjugate to the other one, so that the total Hamiltonian will have the parity invariant. So the system will be PT invariant. So that means all these states will be twofold degenerate. Now you can open a gap here without breaking the time reversal symmetry by allowing tunneling between them. Yeah. We allow a tunneling which, is, which doesn't flip spin so that uh, this will be a simple tight bonding tunneling between these two layers. And the tunneling need to be anisotropic. So there will be an on-site tunneling on the same site, and there also has to be a nearest neighbor. And I'll tell you why it has to be this way. So that turns out to be the, uh, to be the, um, to be the Dirac mass. So you can open a gap, and then if you increase this tunneling, larger than the spin orbit coupling, you see that the bands will be inverted. And this will be guaranteed to have a topological phase with, um, uh, with um, eight states. So this is done in a 2D, so this is a quantum spin hole effect. But if you grow it, more such layers, we also showed that you can also get a 3D topological insulators. So this, there is only one band inversions at the gamma point that guarantees you to any dimensions, it will be a logical insulators. So that's the principle, the helicity inversion induced topological phase. That, and we took it very seriously. We started looking at so just applying these principles to many settings, including in the bulk, whether this principle is actually at work for getting the topological phase. And, uh, one of the things that we, uh, we wanted to do is you take gallium arsenic and you dope it with aluminum, 30% aluminum, you see that the G factor of this material completely changes to minus. Whatever the value it had, the pristine one, it changes to minus of that. That means you can think of having a spin orbit coupling being completely flipped. So if you prepare a um, um, heterostructure between them, that's like a Felicity inversions between them, and you can get a topological phase. And then optical lattices, there are, earlier there were only 1D spin orbit coupling that was um, possible to prepare. Now there are 2D spin orbit coupling as well, but in those uh, few years back, so then if you wanted to get a topological phase in 2D or 3D, how do you do that? 
And what we said is that you take one layer with one spin orbit coupling, you prepare another layer with opposite spin orbit coupling, and you allow tunneling, you will be able to generate such a thing. And also through interactions. So if you think of a nesting between these two helical states, and the nesting has a magic value such that the spin orbit coupling changes sign by this q to be pi zero, then you can also get an interaction which induces the topological phase. And if you look into some of these or many of these materials, and if you if you try to investigate why these materials are topological insulator, and you see, and if you look at the charge density for each layer, you will find that in most of these materials, these are layer material, the spin orbit or the charge density is completely opposite. So that means the spin orbit coupling in different uh, layers are also opposite, and that probably plays a key role to have these materials topological insulators. So, so now, now I'll tell you how you diagnose this to be a topological insulator. What you do is that you find a proper basis in which you can uh, calculate the churn number. But the total churn number of this material because of the time reversal invariance is zero, but you can try to find um, uh, some way to calculate churn number of, for some of the subsystems of the system uh, of this total Hamiltonian. So that means what you do is that because the, there is a twofold degeneracy at all k points, you can block diagonalize this Hamiltonian. And if you find the proper way to block diagonalize, you will find that there are two blocks which, uh, which are degenerate, and each one uh, doesn't have time reversals. Uh, so one of them will be the time reversal conjugate of the other one. So that means you can define churn number for, uh, for each block. And uh, so this will be the Hamiltonian for each block. The churn number for each block will be plus minus. That will be determined by the sign of the spin orbit coupling. One interesting thing is that in both blocks, the, uh, the Dirac mass becomes same. So that means if the Dirac mass changes sign, both blocks will have a uh, finite churn number with the churn number being opposite for both of them. And that is the uh, Dirac mass here. And so the condition for the Dirac mass to have sign change is that it has to go through go through a zero at some k point, and that sets the criteria that d0 and d1 has to have same sign, and also d0 has to be smaller than d1, the continuum limit, and there will be an equivalent condition in the lattice limit. Once you have this condition satisfied, this will give you a quantum spin holes effect, and uh, it states and all. <coughs> and if you look at the Brillouin zone, so you can just think of, uh, because this is a k-square, so this is where it will go to zero. So inside the parity of the states will be minus one and outside is plus one. Once you have this criteria satisfied, you will have a quantum spin hole state. And these are the uh, numerical simulations for that. What we will do is that, so, so, so this talk is not about finding what sort of interactions you get and so it's not the, to study the, the phase diagram of a uh, 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 of interacting Hamiltonian. But just to get what sort of interactions you can get here, uh, we took a very minimal Hubbard model with uh, intra sublattice and inter sublattice. And if you write in terms of the densities, spin density and chiral density, uh, time reversal breaking order parameter that you can think of are ferromagnetism, anti ferromagnetism, the spin thing, and also for the chiral magnet or sublattice magnet, which will be for the chiral densities. One for the up spin and down spin, if they are opposite for sigma uh, for tau x, and you will have a time reversal symmetry breaking. For tau y, it naturally breaks because of the imaginary part. So these are the four uh, Hartree-Fock uh, interactions that will have time reversal order parameter, and the corresponding exchange energy will be the order parameter times the interactions. So we'll study one at a time here, and we'll also compare how these things look in terms of the uh, famous AZ uh, uh, classification of these topological phases. So this will be our table, and this is the table I will compare. And as I said, we'll start with this Z2 class for two dimensions, which has time reversal symmetry and charge conjugations and uh, all of them. And you, you expect that it will give a Z2, and that's what you also get, quantum spin hole state. Then we'll start with the ferromagnetism, and it doesn't, 
it doesn't have the time reversal symmetry, but it has the charge conjugations and all. So you expect that it should get, uh, you should get a Chan insulator, which is the Z class here. But what we will show that it has the quantum spin hole state up to a critical exchange energy. Then we try to reconcile that you lose that symmetry, then you can think of that you sort of get an effective symmetry which will mimic the time reversal symmetry. So then you start looking into what all symmetry you have broken and so on. And here we will see that a parity which is kind of a placeholder here. So parity would be one but you can also have a similar uh, lattice symmetry like uh, four fold rotation symmetry, translation and so on and so forth. So with the help of those parity, for example, here you see that there is a CP symmetry, CP square, which will turn out to be the protecting symmetry. That's why you have a Z2. And then, yeah, so it, eventually if, uh, if you go above the exchange energy, then you will get back what you expect here, which will be the uh, quantum anomalous Hall effect. Let me show you how this happens. This is exactly the topological a criteria I set out for quantum spin hole state, then if you give a ferromagnetism, it will be magnetisms on both layer. What it turns out is that this exchange energy will turn out to be to be added to the uh, to the Dirac mass for each one, and Dirac mass being just a constant term added to the Dirac mass for plus and minus for these two blocks. And the criteria, if you remember. The criteria will change to this one. D0 plus minus EM by D1 has to be greater than 0. As long as this criteria is satisfied for small values of EM, exchange energy, you will still have the um, quantum spin hole state. And that is what you see. You do not have the degeneracy anymore because you break the PT symmetry. But you, the both bands, both species will still have the band inversions and you will have a helical edge state. And as exchange energy goes above the critical value of the band mass, you lose the you lose the band inversions in one of the species, and then you get a quantum anomalous Hall effect. So then, what we do is that we put this chiral magnet to be a magnet on the uh, different chiral species. And if you look at the symmetry table you only have chiral symmetry, you lose everything else. So we expect, we expect that there should not be any topological phase. On the other hand, we see that the quantum spin hole state, you actually do not, so this is a very interesting one. You actually do not destroy the topological phase at all. The way to see is that you go back to the Hamiltonian that I showed. And another thing, so, so far in the literature, people have started, so you break one symmetry, you break two symmetry and you get, a combined symmetry to become the defining symmetry, but here we had to take one more step up. So you break all the three symmetries and you get a triple component, that is the CPT com component that turns out to be the defining symmetry for this step. Yeah. So the way it goes this way, so the, uh, so the perturbation will be in this form. And what it turns out is that this perturbation comes as a constant energy shift to H plus to each block. So individually, so individually they are churn insulators. So in a churn band, if you just shift this entire band up and down, it doesn't destroy the churn, uh, churn number of that band. And it turns out that way. So it's just a constant energy shift to H plus and H minus. Different constant energy shifts to a different churn band, that doesn't matter. But for each of them, it will be just a constant energy shift. What this does is that, the constant energy shift is like a Newton mass, it does not do anything to the churn number. So, we will always have quantum spin hole state for this time reversal broken system. And here, the A states has uh, something interesting. You get two copies of these A states for helical. And if you look at where are they, they will come to different sides of the lattice. In one side, uh, let us say this is the kx directions, one of the helical A states will be shifted. Uh, from the gamma point, in the other one it will be shifted right hand. So there one can expect there will be some chiral anomaly and all and we do study uh, that. Uh, I have 10 minutes to the talk or 10 minutes includes the discussion. Okay.
Okay. So, so, so if you just think of the typical chiral anomaly in one dimension, so this is your continuity equations and this is the extra term you get where the, the charge and currents are not the total charge or current, but these are the chiral charge and chiral current, which is the right moving current minus left moving current. That's your chiral current and same for the charge. You see that that chiral charge and chiral current doesn't have the continuity equation modulo this um, electric field times this number. And here spin is the, uh, sigma is the spin. So for different spin, you'll have different uh, opposite value. So that means if you take the total chiral charge, the plus for the two, uh, two spins, you do not have any chiral anomaly. But if you subtract them, you take a spin or, or helical charge or helical current, if you like, then you will have the one test value. You can go on and put a E to B del V by del T, you get a current which is quantized in the voltage, not in the electric with a square by H. That's what we call helical anomaly. And one can do a similar exercise by applying an in-plane magnetic field there will be a Zeeman splitting of these two states. And if you cal cal calculate the current, there will also be a current which is proportional to the magnetic field in the same directions as the, as the, uh, as the magnetic field. So that's similar to the chiral magnetic effect, one can expect here to have a helical magnetic effect. This is the case for chiral magnet. And, and uh, yeah, so now I will do the antiferromagnetism in which case also one expect to have a Z class of topological phase, but what we find is the Z2 class, but it's not a quantized one, it's a anomalous spin hole effect. So the antiferromagnetic order will come as an octagonal term, so churn numbers will no longer be defined for this Hamiltonian, if it's an octagonal term that will have the interactions between these two churn bands, so you cannot define a churn band of the system anymore. But if you actually look at, so, so this is a, uh, this is an order which is a PT invariant order. So that means your, your, your bands are still twofold degenerate as it was for the paramagnetic case. If you look at the band structure in the bulk state, they are actually adiabatically connected. And as we know, adiabatic continuity is a very important criteria for topological phase. So in that respect, you actually do not, you have not done so much to the bulk still remains adiabatically connected to the quantum spin hole state. But in the edge, you have a gap. So then you can think of what should be the topological anomaly. And um, this has some interesting mod, um, correspondence to, the, to some other model that we find out. Is that, so if you think of the antiferromagnetism, you have two magnetisms for the two layers to be opposite. If you just choose a proper basis, this turns out to be a complex hopping between these two layers. That means as you, as an electron hops from one layer to another layer, it gains an extra phase. That phase turns out to be a, like a vortex. That will give a new topological phase here. So if you, then you just write down this Hamiltonian in terms of two different gamma matrices, and the, if they anticommute, you have a Jackie Rossi sort of model. So you can have a topology defined in terms of the spin orbit coupling, or you have a topology defined in terms of, or the, the winding number defines in terms of this complex hopping. And if you look at where, where uh, how this hopping will change, it turns out that this, this phase depends exactly on this, this Dirac mass. If the Dirac mass changes sign, it will have a discontinuous jump from plus pi to minus pi. So the derivative will have a uh, delta functions here, and that gives you the anomalous Hall effect, which is not quantized, but it depends on where these band inversions are happening. So any 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 varying non-quantized um, um, Hall effect gives an anomalous current, and that's the, the that will be the uh, anomalous spin. Current. And the last one is the chiral sublattice, which is exactly the same as the antiferromagnetism. So I will not discuss so much. Uh, so, 
So the chiral sublattice order is like a complex hopping between them. It breaks time reversal symmetry. And as I showed earlier, so this is same as the antiferromagnetic phase. So everything that we talked about for the anomaly will exactly remain the same. And in addition, one can also think of a magnetoelectric effect here, because if you have a if you have a, a real space, if you have a uh, if you have a, um, a Hall effect which is spatial dependent, the gradient of that Hall effect also gives you a current. So this will be like this case. So you have a Hall effect which is plus half here, it will have a Hall effect minus half here. So there will be a current between them that can give you a magnetization which will be proportional to the um, voltage applied. There will be a magnetoelectric effect. I think that, so one can again go and study other things here which I will not talk about here and you do see that whereas the, you expect that one of this topological phase according to this uh, topological uh, table, but you do see that the quantum spin hall states are much more robust to the time reversal um, breaking perturbations. With that, I will conclude that the symmetry breaking is not necessarily the essential criteria to find out what sort of topological phase we will have. So there are more things like uh, the band inversions and also uh, is boundary um, bulk boundary correspondence, they also play important role. And I demonstrated this in terms of only examples, but I guess there also can be some generality one should explore in the other, other topological phase. And we talked about helical anomaly, magnetoelectric effect, and so on and so forth. That, thank you very much. <coughs> I think that this uh, business of uh, uh, symmetry breaking may be a, a bit more subtle. A uh, couple of years ago, uh, with Eagle Mayo, we showed that uh, if you take a, a two-dimensional time, time reversal invariant uh, topological insulator uh, and uh, change the confining potential at the edge, uh, then uh, never mind that the Hamiltonian is still time reversal invariant, you can have spontaneous symmetry breaking, namely the ground state breaks the symmetry without the Hamiltonian breaking the symmetry. And, uh, and then you lose the, the, the topological protection, for example, against the single particle A scattering. Uh, so in one of the places I said, although you do break the time reversal symmetry, the usual way of defining time reversal symmetry, but you can recover a similar symmetry by having another broken symmetry. In some cases, I showed that it could be the parity which can come as a rescue. If you break parity and time reversal both, but the PT symmetry can be invariant and that can be your defining symmetry. But in many other examples, like antiferromagnetic, topological antiferromagnetic insulator, it is also when you break the time reversal symmetry, but if you go to another sublattice, you and if you take the sublattice, you also break the translational symmetry. And if you take the product of them, you have a symmetry which will define your Z2. Yeah, so your question. So your Hamiltonian still respect that symmetry. So that means that that symmetry operator commutes with that Hamiltonian. But your eigenstates will not be the eigenst the the uh, the. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. I mean, the way we define is that you take the mean field Hamiltonian, the eigenstates. So you, your, your Hamiltonian doesn't commute with that amiable symmetry anymore. But then also in some case, yeah. There is a spontaneous symmetry break. Yeah, in, I mean, if you don't go into the mean field level, then it has. Then it has. So the mean field Hamiltonian, yeah, actually, yeah. So, No, no, mean field Hamiltonian, because I mean, the way, I mean, how do you define it, uh, Hamiltonian symmetry in terms of physical uh, uh, consequence, if there is a magnetism or not? Or if, if there is a. Hmm? Uh, that is not going to commute with the mean field Hamiltonian. Then you break it. Yeah. I mean, your, your actual interaction Hamiltonian is an interacting Hamiltonian and it has the symmetry, but as no, actually, I don't know. Summation, but the, uh, I mean, the Hamiltonian itself has yeah. the symmetry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then something is broken. Yeah, so you break, let's say you have a magnetization that is developing, so then you define a main, mean field Hamiltonian and it, then it breaks. That mean field Hamiltonian breaks. Any other questions? There are no more questions. Let's start. thank the speaker again.